Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and welcome to another episode of Northwood Scientist. Now this is an episode I've been looking forward to doing for quite some time. I did one on laser ring gyros a couple of months ago and it was very popular and I wanted to complete the journey. So today we're going to talk about three different instruments. The first is a mechanical gyroscope. Now a mechanical gyroscope has several problems with it including one of precession. So we're going to talk about how we solve that problem with laser gyroscopes. And then we're going to finish up with how we took advantage of those problems with a mechanical gyro compass. So, without further ado, let's get started. Now here's the interesting thing about a gyroscope. Even though the base of the gyroscope is generally very small and it's very top heavy, once you spin it up, it will remain upright. Now why is that? It's because of something called conservation of angular momentum. If we take a round object like this piece of styrofoam that's not rotating, it's not very stable. It can easily be moved around with very minimal force. However, if you were to rotate this about a central axis like my pen here, say in this direction, you would create a force called angular momentum. Now that force is aligned with this central axis of rotation. And the way you tell the direction of the force is you curl the fingers of your right hand around the object in the direction of the rotation and stick your thumb up. So the direction of force would be between the base of my pen and the cap of my pen. The faster this object rotated, the bigger this force would be. Now, that sets up something very interesting, and that is how a gyroscope works. It's called conservation of angular momentum. Let's just go back and look at the axis of rotation. Here is the direction and the vector of the angular momentum of this object that is rotating on this axis of rotation. Unless an outside force acts on it to move it, it's going to remain in this plane and in this direction. That's how a gyroscope stays up, even though it has a very small base and it's very top heavy. That's how you can balance it on a piece of string. It wants to continue to go in this direction around this axis of rotation. So why does the spinning gyroscope wobble and seem to go around in a circle? That's a process called precession. Okay, so recall I said that if you had an axis of rotation, like my pen here, this was actually a direction of force called the angular momentum. Recall that even though the gyroscope was going around it in this direction, the force by the right hand rule was 90 degrees to that, just like my thumb is. And I told you that unless an outside force acted on this axis of rotation or this angular momentum, it was going to stay in exactly the same direction. Let's take a little exercise. Here's our, here's our disc of our gyro, okay? Now, if I apply a force here, how will this disc bend? Now, most folks would think that it would bend down that way, right at the, right at the point of force. However, it doesn't. What it actually does is it bends to the side. Now, let's figure out why that happens. Now let's go back to our pen here. Here is our axis of rotation or our angular momentum. Now, when I put a torque on this to try and rotate it like that, I can take my right hand, curl my fingers in the direction of that rotation, and I can see the direction of the force. It's literally, even though I'm moving it this way, or trying to move it this way, the force is actually directed back towards my nose. So back to our example. Now, here's my disc. I'm going to apply a force on this side to try and dip it down. That's going to try and bend the axis in this direction, and there is the direction of the force. So this pen is not going to try and bend towards the camera. It's actually 
going to bend this way in response to that torque force pointing that way. Now here's the problem of precession with a gyroscope. If the axis of the rotation and the angular momentum was straight up and down and in line with gravity, there would be no force trying to move it in any direction. However, for reasons that will become clear later, it will never stay directly upright and in line with gravity. It will always bend. Now, once it's bent, gravity will try and apply a torque to bring it around like that. And by the right hand rule, as we place that torque on it from gravity, it will attempt to move that way because that is the direction of the force. And as a result, instead of staying upright, as it leans over, it will start wobbling around like this. And we can see that in the video of the gyroscope. Now, if you get right down to it, because the gyroscope will start wobbling like this, that's actually proof that there is a downward force acting on this gyroscope. Kind of interesting and food for thought. Okay, so while most of us understand that a gyroscope, once it spins up, will try and stay in the same position unless an outside force acts on it, we've now seen that there is an outside force acting on it, and that's the force of gravity. There is a force that causes the gyroscope to go off balance, and then gravity starts acting on it and causing it to process. This limits its use in navigation and other functions where we need to have a steady frame of reference. So what we did to overcome this is we took out the mass. We took out the mechanical parts of the gyroscope and went to something that was not affected by gravity. And that is the laser gyroscope. Now, in order to understand the laser ring gyroscope and its cousin, the fiber optic gyroscope, we need to understand a little bit about the nature of light. Light can be considered to travel in waves. Now, as you can see by this diagram, if you have wave X and wave Y, these are two beams of light that are of the same frequency, which means that the wavelengths are basically mirror images of each other. In the situation on the left, you have what's called constructive interference. You notice that the peak of wave X and the peak of wave Y occur at the same time, as do the troughs of wave X and wave Y. As a result, the resulting waveform, which is waveform Z or zeta, is twice the amplitude of the first two. Now in the second situation on the right, you see destructive interference. Notice that the peak of wave X falls on the trough of wave Y. And as a result, when they add together, they form a flat line. This is the basis of the fiber optic and the laser ring gyro. Now here is a diagram of the very basic components of a laser ring gyro. The cylinder there is a laser generator and it shoots out a laser beam of a certain frequency in phase 180 degrees in opposite directions. These laser beams hit mirrors and are angled up to a readout sensor, which determines whether they are in phase or out of phase and at what rate of change that phase is undergoing. You can see that if you rotate this laser ring gyro in the plane of the table that it's sitting on, you can see that one beam may have a slightly longer path to that detector than the other beam. That is how it compares the beams and determines whether that laser ring gyro is being rotated in that plane. The resulting interference pattern due to what's called the Sagnac effect shows these alternating bright and dark bands. 
Now, on commercial airliners, we have something called the inertial reference system, and this is part of the navigation package of the aircraft. In this type of installation, three laser ring gyros are installed and attached directly to the airframe. Now, each of these gyros is in its own axis, the X, the Y, and the Z axis. And as a result, pilots get very detailed information on pitch, roll, and yaw based on these laser ring gyros being rotated. Well, folks, that about wraps it up for this episode. Now, we've gone over mechanical gyroscopes and we've gone over laser gyroscopes. The laser gyro, both the laser ring and the fiber optic gyroscope, were developed to overcome the problem of mechanical gyroscopic precession. Now, on Monday, we'll talk about gyro compasses, which take advantage of gyroscopic precession to seek true north. Now, your homework assignment over the weekend is to see if you can figure out why mechanical gyroscopic precession leads the gyroscope to point to true north. And a hint is right there. So, until then, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from northern Michigan. We'll see you again soon. Please take a moment. Hit that little like and subscribe down there. Maybe have a look at my Twitter account. That's where I release all of my videos first. So we'll be seeing you again soon. Thank you for stopping by.